Oh, excuse me. I'm just completing my tweet and my submission to PH Kicks. Uh, sorry. Um, good afternoon. I'm Les Beich. I'm a consultant to NNPHI. Uh, my day job, the rare days I'm there, is at Florida State University College of Medicine. So good to be here with all of you. And I just want to give an introduction to our next session where we're going to be talking about community health and some of the upstream factors that determine community health uh, from a standpoint of the role of health departments uh, and data. And our speaker is going to be Julie Wellam, uh, Wellams Van Dyke, who is a committed Wisconsinite. Is Wisconsinite what we call people from Wisconsin? Cheesehead, an absolute <laughs> cheesehead. Uh, many of you know her already. She has made many contributions to public health, both nationally and here in Wisconsin, where she's a former local health department official in Marathon County. That sounds like a long way to go. Um, and in addition, she's a deputy director for uh, the County Health Roadmaps Project at the University of Wisconsin Public Health Institute, one of the NNPHI member institutes. She is a PhD uh, in nursing. She's been involved in public health leadership for many years. Please welcome Julie. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. <laughs> You all were a lot more awake this morning when my other Wisconsin colleagues were here. <laughs> yeah, I'm the bookend to the day. We started with my fabulous colleagues from Wisconsin, and I'm the Wisconsin other end of the bookend. So here's what it's like to be from Wisconsin. Um, you have to be a Packer fan. And you know that my son has told me since he was seven years old that his, well, for many years, his firstborn would be named Brett, whether it was a boy or a girl. Uh, Brett's out, Aaron's in. <laughs> Good thing, the Packers just have to keep getting quarterbacks that have uh, names that'll work for either gender. <laughs> so, um, I am also here to share generously from around the nation. Um, I come to you as a pracademic, a term I'm borrowing from Glenn Mays. I learned that at a pre previous Kofi meeting. Uh, Pracademic is a combined practitioner academic, and um, I'm someone who still feels like I have my roots very solidly in the practice world, and I thank all of you for that because um, my travels around the country are to learn from people who are doing this work in communities. Yet as a pracademic, I get the opportunity to share the evidence and research as it's emerging about many areas. So. Um, I also come to you on the shoulders of a really, really great team. Uh, almost everything I do is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they are not only my funding partner, but my intellectual partner in terms of moving health forward in the nation. Our team at the University of Wisconsin is incredible, and many, many partners across the nation. It's always really scary to present in your own state. You know, because part of leadership is confidence and pretending like you know what you're talking about. And the people here actually know what I know. <laughs> I don't know. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. And when I sat down with Jennifer and Sarah and Whitney to talk about what we we're going to do today, it was kind of an organic conversation that evolved amongst many of the paths I'm on. And I kept saying, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. And then I sat down to do it, and I thought, oh my god, how am I going to do all that? So here's how I framed it in my own head. And especially since I know I stand between you and your glass of wine. <laughs> um, is that this presentation is a smorgasbord of ideas. And so I'm going to put a buffet line in front of you of different ideas about how we can work together to create health for all people in our community. And so I'm going to talk about some of these things you see on the goals. But I'm going to share with you as I go through this uh, examples and stories and voices from communities around the nation, too. And I, I sure hope, after the great um, comment and, and uh, pieces about citations that I've got a website up here or a citation for everybody, but if I forgot anyone, I will for sure get that for you. So really an opportunity for you to go through this buffet line, sample what works for you, 
And then hopefully with the information I've given you, um, you've got the recipe for if you want to learn more. <laughs> okay? So, as part of the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Project, um, we have initiated a Roadmaps to Health Prize. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, gave the first prizes earlier this year to the six communities you see up on the screen. And I suspect many of you submitted an application a few weeks ago around the second round of the RWJF Roadmaps to Health Prize, and those of you who haven't yet will do so next year. <laughs> But the RWJF Roadmaps to Health Prize is an opportunity to celebrate great work that's happening in communities along many of the themes we've been hearing about today, around partnership, around advancing health for all people in your community, around focusing on continuous evaluation and improvement, and around focusing across the many factors that influence health and policy systems and environmental change. And along with it, you get a prize of money, no strings attached. You don't have to even do a budget <laughs> um, to really, it really is a prize um, to celebrate the work. And so I thought to start off this session about creating health for all, who better to hear from than the voices from our six prize winning communities. So I am going to, hopefully, Nope. Oh, I'm in the wrong one. Okay, got it. <laughs> Here we go. So, I'm going to show you a little two-minute video that gives you a little glimpse into the six prize-winning communities. And as you listen to their voices, I want you to identify themes or statements that speak to you about what it means to create, create health for all, and then we'll have... Winning the Roadmaps to Health Chance Prize to talk is about it. a validation of the work that we have done as a community. The way we've done our work here really is a roadmap. It's also an opportunity for us to build on the work that we're doing. People from outside our community are saying that the work we're doing matters. We have something to offer even beyond ourselves to teach people where we've come from. It inspires our community to be confident in themselves. I am extremely optimistic about the future of our health. Our students harvest the food from seed to table. We've worked um, on improving the school breakfast. When kids are healthier, their learning sparks. They really feel uh, excited about physical activity. We're trying to focus on factors like literacy that people don't generally associate with health. We've made a concerted effort to address the issues of health disparities. The focus of our work is helping people who have committed crimes to re-enter society, to contribute to their families and to their own um, health. So our focus is absolutely on closing those gaps between haves and have-nots. The key is fostering the kind of multi-sectoral partnerships we've been able to put together here. We've been able to bring together a coalition that doesn't look at just one problem. One of our major goals in addressing health disparities is improving access to health care in some of our poorest neighborhoods. We can achieve many things together that none of us could achieve alone. That's something that gives me lots and lots of hope. So, as you listen to that, just shout out some of the themes you heard from those communities about what they were addressing or focusing on or how they were doing it. What'd you hear? Partnerships. Literacy. Equity, Fill, filling the gaps, right, great. You know, Jennifer and, and Sarah and Whitney asked me to talk about health equity, health disparities, and the multiple determinants of health. And when I listened to that, I've listened to this video many, many times. And when I listened to it again and listened for that, closing the gaps, um, addressing disparities, creating equity, it just seemed to seep out. Um, 
it also always chokes me up every time I hear it. <laughs> um, and what really chokes me up is these are six really cool communities, but I know a lot of what they're doing is happening in your community too. And so, and the other thing I want to share with you is three of those six communities, the health department was the lead agency that submitted that application and led that work going forward. And so um, I think it speaks very well to the role you have in your communities in leading this work. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about, very briefly, about the concepts of disparities, equity, and determinants of health. And then we're going to move into talking about how we make that actionable in our communities. So here's two definitions around health disparities. Um, you'll get all the slides, so you'll have all the websites and all the references um, when you turn in your evaluation and get your flash drive at the end of the conference. But one, I picked these two. The top one is um, a definition of disparities from NIH. The bottom one from the NCSL, anyone know what that is? National Conference of State Legislators, right. Um, and what struck me is, of course, both of them talk about differences. And I think that's the key thing when we're talking about disparities. We're talking about differences between two different groups. But the NCSL one hones in very quickly and focuses on um, disparities that exist across racial and ethnic groups. And so one of the things, that is certainly one of the disparities that is front and center. And Actually, I think when we say disparities, I think it's the first thing that pops up in most of our minds, is thinking about disparities across racial and ethnic groups. As we look at Healthy People 2020 and its um, overarching goal to eliminate disparities, they will track disparities not only on race and ethnicity, but along other differences amongst groups. As you can see, gender. Social, sexual identity and orientation, disability status, and geographic location disparities that exist between rural and urban communities. If we move the concept from disparities, disparities is purely about differences. Is there a difference between people who live in urban areas in your state and rural areas in your state? Is there a difference between men and women? Is there a difference between um, African-American populations, Hispanic populations, and Caucasian populations in your community. What health equity does is lay over a value around that and basically says that it's not right, it's not fair, it's not just. And so what we need to strive for, as Healthy People 2020 says, is a, the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Where health equity gets more challenging in our communities is because we might all agree on data that clearly shows, for example, in the state of Wisconsin, that the infant mortality rate in our state for African American children is three to four times that for Caucasian children. I mean, those are hard numbers, and you look at them and you can do the math on it. But when you start to talk about justice related to that, or fairness, or whether that's avoidable, you're going to get a lot of different opinions about that. And that's what um, introduces more challenge into the health equity conversation. So um, I, I was watching a, a talk from Paula Braverman, uh, um, who is talking about this topic. And she said, you know, for example, we all expect that people who ski are going to have more uh, orthopedic injuries than people who don't ski. We don't think that's particularly unjust. That's just a fact of um, the choices that they make and it's what's going to happen. Um, I was listening to a story on prostate cancer the other day. I mean, obviously, we don't think it's unjust that men are going to get prostate cancer at a higher rate than women. But I think most of us in this room would agree that it is unjust, the rate that prostate cancer affects African American men and kills them as compared to Caucasian men. So I think the challenge for us as we think about going forward, we think about your role as public health leaders, is one of the skills that we need to develop and hone is how do we have conversations about values when we move into work about creating health for all. I think it's something that's been under the table and we haven't talked about very much. But a real skill is how we are overt about talking about the values that drive our work 
and where we share values and where our values may be in contact with each other. And I keep thinking about this work and thinking I'd love to go to the Capitol <laughs> and have that conversation with our legislators. Because the great divide that we all talk about, I think, comes down to a conversation about different values driving where we're going. And I actually am very optimistic and believe we could find more common ground about that. So I love this image. It's from an older edition of a document from NACHO. But this really illustrates it for me. And this, you know, I've shared this with a lot of students and they get it like this. It is not just that the green guy is higher on the ladder than the orange guy. I mean, the fact that they're at different places, that's a disparity. One's higher than the other. But it's the fact about the rungs on the letter, ladder. And that equity is about making sure both of those ladders have an equal number of rungs on them so that um, they have a playing field, an environment that supports their health moving forward. So it's not just about being lower, it's about creating an environment where there's equal opportunity for everyone to succeed. So I um, saw this video, it was shared by me, shared with me um, by Ann Berna. Are, are you here, Ann? Yep, yeah, Ann. Um, and so I wanted to show you this. This comes from Bernalillo County, um, New Mexico, and I think they've just, and it, it comes from a local public health council, and they've just done a really great job of illustrating what health equity is about. So, let's The Truth it. About Health, a video series of stories. Story one. Why is Jason in the hospital? Created by Martin Munoz and Matt Cross again. Meet Jason. Say hi, Jason. Meet Andres. Say hi, Andres. Andres wants to know why Jason is in the hospital with an infection. Because he has a cut on his leg. Because he was playing in an empty lot by his apartment building and got cut on an old car. Because his neighborhood is kind of run down. A lot of kids play there and there's no one there to watch them. Because his parents can't afford a nicer place to live. Even though both of his parents work, they have a hard time paying the bills. Even though his parents are very hard workers, and even have multiple jobs, but they don't have a lot of education, so none of their jobs pays very much. They work so hard, there's very little time to be with Jason, even though they want to be. Whatever happened to the values of humanity, whatever happened to the fairness and equality, instead of spreading love, we're spreading animosity, lack of understanding leading us away from unity, that's the reason why sometimes I'm feeling under, that's the reason why sometimes I'm feeling down. A lot of things affect Jason's health. There are a lot of topics in this story and some may even seem unrelated to health. For an industrialized nation, the U.S. is one of the more unhealthy countries in the world. Health care is needed to treat Jason's infection. But community health deals with all the other issues. Safe built environment, ample social connectedness, access to good education, good paying jobs. We all deserve quality health care. But when will we, as adults, find the Andres within us and keep asking why? Why are so many of us getting so sick? Why are some communities much sicker than others? If we keep asking why, we'll focus more on keeping us all healthy instead of just treating illness. Treating Jason's infection is important, but focusing on why he got sick in the first place. Why doesn't he have a clean, safe park near his home? We call that part of his built environment. Why isn't an adult around to watch him? That is part of his social environment. Created by Bernalillo County Environmental Health.
Bernalillo County Community Health Council. Bernalillo County Place Matters. Look us up already. I just think that would be a great video to show at the beginning of a community health assessment planning process and, and really start to have that discussion amongst your partners. I also thought, as I watched it again, it's a great thing for a quality improvement crowd, the five whys getting at root cause analysis. <laughs> so, you know, wherever you look, you can see, see um, how to instill quality improvement. Many of you are familiar with this model from um, the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative, and it really looks at moving upstream to think about what creates these inequities in our community. And so if you look at the right side, it looks at looking at end stage outcomes such as mortality and morbidity rates, injury rates, looking up towards risk factors, and then ultimately looking at issues of um, physical and social environments, uh, institutional power, and um, root causes of inequity. What I share with people all the time, because I've talked with a lot of people about this whole concept of inequity, and if you're a community that has never talked about health equity, you're probably not gonna start at the far left-hand side of this document and begin discussing institutional power differences. But if you haven't, you can at least start at the downstream level and move one step up at a time to begin to enter into these discussions about root causes, looking at differences, and thinking about how that's going to affect our work moving forward. So how we affect that work is focusing on the multiple determinants of health. And you will hear me as I talk. I do not typically talk about the social determinants of health. I talk about the multiple determinants of health because it is all of those determinants that create health, one of which is social determinants, social and economic factors. And I think when we pull out social determinants, we sometimes lose its place in the bigger picture and we also lose our audience. And so if you can help people understand all of these different factors that influence health and then pivot over to saying, and let's not forget about these social and economic factors, you're, you're gonna have more success in engaging our non-public health partners in thinking through this. I'm gonna quickly go through a couple of models that have have um, provided the foundation for this. Evans and Stoddard is, is my fathers of the multiple determinants of health theory and where I really learned this. But one of the things that really strikes me is look at the date on that, 1994. And I think that actually might be wrong. I think it was maybe 91. But at any rate, uh, it, it struck me as I was putting this together last week that the multiple determinants of health model is being really an embedded model that we all believe in is younger than my oldest, my youngest child. <laughs> so it's come about since I had kids and I'm not that old. So this is really new. It's really new stuff. And it's really grounded in most of us. But the other message I have for this audience here, I know I'm talking to the choir, is that our, our friends and our colleagues in our communities don't know this. And, um, I have had the great privilege of working with some really cool people from Wyandotte County, Kansas, and some great work led by their mayor, Joe Reardon. And one of the things Mayor Joe Reardon has said to me many times is, Julie, you know what? When I went to law school, they did not have a class on the multiple determinants of health. And it was not until the county health rankings told him that his county was the lowest ranking county in Kansas, he said that I began to understand how these different factors fit together. He said, I thought, how could that be? The KU Academic Medical Center is in my town. How can we not be the healthiest place? There's places in Kansas that don't even have a hospital. And so I tell that story because Mayor Reardon has a message for all of us, which is talk till your tongue bleeds about these many factors that influence health. Because while well, we get it, many people don't. So the Europeans um, showed us this model of how environment creates choices around health. RWJF seeded a commission to build a healthier America back in 2008. That commission will be meeting again, reconvening um, this month, next week. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, to really help focus this work, I think they were a real impetus at the foundation, for, uh, at RWJF, for helping them think differently and moving some of their funding decisions to really focus on these many, many factors that influence health. Healthy People 2020, very grounded in the multiple determinants of health. Um, and I suspect, like Wisconsin, many of your state health plans and local health plans, very, very grounded in this model. Of course, you would not have me get through a presentation without showing my favorite slide, <laughs> the model that underpins the county health rankings. And I'm sure many of you have seen this slide, but one of the things I've heard from folks around the nation about this particular model um, and the data that accompanies it is that message that Mayor Reardon gave us, is it's easy to understand, it's clean, it's just like public health kicks, <laughs> um, clean and neat and people can get their arms around it and see how all of the different sectors in our community contribute to health and how these many different elements contribute to how long people live and how well people live. I will tell you, one of the limitations is it makes it look like everything's completely separate and distinct, doesn't it? Looks like health behaviors is here and clinical care is here and social and economic is here. And we all know that those boxes overlap each other and you know, it really is three-dimensional and more web-like than linear. And I, I got that, and I brought that feedback back, and we've had a lot of conversations on our team about should we make it a web, should we make it a circle, should we put arrows in it? And I, I'm here to say, I think if we did that, we would mess ourselves up, because we'd lose the opportunity to start conversations with many, many people about these many factors that influence health. So just know that that is part of the evolution and the organic nature of the conversations that'll happen, even though it's not depicted in the model. I have a great data colleague once who said, you know the problem with models is, as soon as you put an arrow in a model, people in the community's eyes glaze over. And as soon as you put a bi-directional arrow in a model, their heads go on the table. <laughs> And so our complexity and being sure we explain every possible relationship so we're pure to the science often means we lose the message. So, so those determinants, I'm gonna just go through this really quickly so we can get to the action piece. But a lot of times people ask me about the weighting on those determinants and it really is the result of a lot of different things that we've looked at. One is history. And if you think about history, um, different times and different periods really influence how we improve health in different ways. So the early part of last century, it was really about sanitation and improving our built environment. Then we moved into a period where we really had great advances in medical care, antibiotics and surgeries and imaging devices and pharmaceuticals and transplants and things like that. You know, the Surgeon General sent us on a, a, a period of time where we really focused on health behaviors. You know, that warning that came out in 65 on the pack of cigarettes was a turning point for thinking about health behaviors in a period of time. And more recently now, a focus on social and economic factors. And it'd be interesting to think what people will be writing about this period of time 20 years from now. We looked at the literature, and this is a seminal article um, by Michael McGinnis, Pamela Russo, and others that looked at thinking about the relative contribution. And you will see this relative allocation in many, many presentations and articles um, to this day of the relative distribution of these factors. And then our team at Wisconsin did some analysis based on our longer tenure of work with the Wisconsin County Health Rankings and came out with this distribution based on a, a factor analysis. So I think the exact distribution is not as important as going back to the message that I started with, which is many factors influence health and in order to have people live the longest and healthiest lives, we need to pay attention to all of them. And we need to do it through taking action. And so what I'd like to do for the second half of the presentation is go through the different steps in an action cycle to improve health in your community and relate it back to how we can think of issues of disparities, equity and creating health for all by focusing across those many factors that influence health. So let's start um, by looking at, well, 
I thought we were gonna start by looking at work together. <laughs> so hold on just a minute. We'll come right here. So back in 1988, year I entered public health, the IOM released the first report on the future of public health and they said we were a system in disarray and they presented this model and said really where public health should be is in the middle of the circle of partners looking at what creates health in the community. And in that report, I think this is the one Vinnie was referring to this morning that kind of got sideswiped by 9-11. Um, in 2002, that report came out. Oh, it's not working. But, it, it, oh, it's not working because I'm not pressing the button, <laughs> the right button. <laughs> so the 2002 IOM report moved public health into the circle with other partners, which is where you'll see it in our take action model and put assuring the conditions for population health in the middle. And I think this is very consistent with where we need to be today. Now I told you, three of the um, prize winning communities were led by local health departments. But one was led by a local United Way, one was led by a local tribe, and one was led by a local community health improvement coalition that had, was a separate 501c3. And just that little example of those six winning communities, I think, tells us that there's different places from which leadership can emerge in your community. And I think part of the role of being a nimble and flexible public health leader is seeing when it's important to lead from the front, because nobody else is doing it, and when it's important to lead from behind and support the leadership of other organizations in your community. And when it's important to nurture the development of leadership through other organizations in your community because we all know there are limited resources, too much is put at the, at the doors of public health agencies, and the strategy for us to move community health improvement forward is to certainly expand the size of the orchestra that's playing the music together and help nurture those different partners. The Trust for America's Health in recent reports has really illustrated this and begun to call the role of you uh, of us as public health leaders, as public health strategists. And I really like that idea. And think about what a strategist does. Sometimes a strategist leads, sometimes they help create the game plan, sometimes they sit on the side and are the coach. So really thinking about your role now as public health strategists. And as you do that and think about where you're focusing your activities in your community and which of those health factor areas, there's going to be different groups of people that need to come to the table to work together. So it is a little chaotic because you might have a big group and then you have a small group doing this and a small group doing that and then there's that organization over there that's doing something and they don't even know they're part of your effort, but you're considering them part of your effort. and so. Um, part of it is figuring out how to bring all of those together in a fashion that's moving together in your community. But I heard a, a local public health leader um, from the city of Detroit say, we need to get over the idea there's only one table. And we certainly need to get over the idea that the only table is the public health table. There are multiple tables working on uh, moving health forward in our community. And part of the role of the public health strategist is to know what's happening everywhere and connect people to each other. So you are a quilter, quilting the squares together. You're a weaver, you're an orchestra director, you're a coach. I think all of those roles are part of being the public health strategist. So communicate, another key overarching role in taking action to create health for all. And there is a great document that was released in 2010 by um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called A New Way to Talk About the Social Determinants of Health. Um, and I still think, even though it's three years old, this is one of the best documents out there that talk to us. And, and you have the citation on the slide. You'll have this, or you can Google it, or go to the RWJF website and find it. But it really, to me, helped me get out of my academic ease when I remember, and talk in plain language. And every time I talk about this document, I go back and reread it. 
the core of the document's only about 15 pages long. And these are really their seven key messages. And the first one, I mean, every one of us suffers from jargonitis, including, is it coffee or Kofi? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I say coffee because I'm a big lover of it. <laughs> hmm? Bingo coffee? Okay. <laughs> Is it nacho or nacho? <laughs> um, you know, people, uh, we hired a non-public health person on our team a year ago. Best thing we ever did to cure our jargonitis because she calls us on it all the time including this report says, one of the most important things to expunge from your public health vocabulary is the term social determinants. That as soon as you say that word, people glaze over and don't really know what we're talking about. You notice on the county health rankings model, it doesn't say health determinants. It says health factors, the factors that influence health. I'm not sure factors is exactly the right term. I mean, it's not very sexy either, but at least it's more approachable, I think, than determinants has been. So, um, so I think it's really helpful to think, don't use that term. I had a hospital um, colleague uh, attend a meeting where, with primarily public health people, we were talking about how we could move together with public health and hospitals working on the community health needs assessment, the community benefits. And we were talking about how we needed to come to a consensus about a, a model for health, and did we want to use the county health rankings model, or did we want to use the healthiest Wisconsin 2020 model, or did we want to use the healthy people 2020 model, or which model did we want to do? And finally she raised her hand, she goes, I don't know what you're talking about. And I feel stupid. I have a master's degree, but I feel stupid with all your jabber, jabber, jabber about model, 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 model. Now, you know, the good thing is, we had candor. It was the most powerful moment in the meeting because we had someone actually tell us how they felt about what we're doing. And so one of the things I'm trying to expunge from my language now is model. And I'm trying to call models pictures. Here's a picture that helps us understand how these different pieces link together. Because her perception was, this is a well-educated woman, is from Madison, Wisconsin is that that's the university people talking to us about models. <laughs> so we'll never get it 100% that we, we are sensitive to everybody's trigger point. But I think it's, it's helpful to hear how different people hear things. I, want, I could spend the whole time talking about this piece. But one thing I want to do before I move off of communicate is this piece about incorporate the role of personal responsibility and mix conservative and progressive values. So this is a real, this is, there's a lot of debate about this and about whether we should ever mention personal responsibility and if we should just stick to talking about creating environments that support healthy choices. Um, I was a health officer in a fairly conservative part of this state. It's even more conservative now than it was four years ago when I was there. And worked with some very, very conservative board members. And my experience was if I could start with, yes, people are responsible for their own choices, and we need to make sure they live in environments where those choices are easy to make. And I have to tell you, the local waitress was the most important voice in talking about smoke-free air policy because she talked about making healthy choices herself, choosing not to smoke, but when she went to work, how she didn't have that choice anymore. And she was very, very powerful, but she told the story of personal responsibility. I'm trying to do the right thing, and I need an environment that continues to support that right behavior. So. I think, um, you know, as we think, of, I do understand that, you know, if you look at the picture with the ladder, the two guys on the ladder, and if it's only about personal responsibility, then the guy on the right who has no rungs is supposed to be climbing as fast as the guy who has a lot of rungs. And we need to be sure people don't get stuck there. Um, but it's, it, I have found it, especially in very conservative communities, to be very effective to start with Yes, people are responsible for their own health. And, not but, not but, because then that makes them competitive with each other. But, and we need to make 
the healthy choice, the easy choice, as Dr. Frieden has taught us all to say. So the other thing I, I have to stop and say is one fact, not dozens. And also when you give a number, give a simple number. I can't tell you the amount of times I have done this. Everything I do, I, I, I tell you not to do now, I have done. 77.25% um, of people, <laughs> not three quarters of people, <laughs> which would be is much more easy for people to hear. So one fact and one story instead of dozens. Um, and I think we'll move people forward. Okay, let's talk about that right side of the wheel, the community health assessment side of the wheel, the assess needs and resource and the focus on what's important. And here's some tips here as we think about health disparities, health equity and the multiple determinants of health. Um, as we do our assessments, it's really important that we look at data across all of the different determinants or health factors um, that influence health. It's also very important that we disaggregate data by multiple different ways that we will see disparities within our community by race, ethnicity, income, education, gender, geography. Um, you know, I heard Linda Conlon this morning talk about how um, her community, Oneida County, was 98% Caucasian. Now it's 96% Caucasian, so it was difficult to respond to the issue of disparities. But I know Linda and her group, I've talked with her, have looked at, they know there's disparities in their community, even if you're 96% Caucasian. There are disparities based on geography in that county. There are disparities based on income, based on education. Um, and so we need to continue to do that. now. I also know in an Oneida County, Wisconsin, with 48,000 people, and even more so in Florence County, Wisconsin, where there's 4,500 people, there's no data. <laughs> um, there is no quantitative data disaggregated by those um, particular categories in those small communities. And I suspect that affects many, many people in this room. So it's something we need to continue to think about and work on, but something that's going to be hard forever for always with small numbers if you want good, reliable, stable data. And so I would suggest, this is the nurse in me definitely coming out, is that qualitative data is important data. And talking to your community and engaging with your community and doing surveys of your community, but even more importantly, having conversations with your community through key informant interviews and focus groups and town hall meetings and listening to your public health nurses who come back and know everything about your community is important data collection to get at where the disparities are in your community because the stories about the differences amongst these different groups is equally important to the fact that there's this many people with um, low income that smoke and this many people that don't. The other piece about assessment and thinking across about creating health for all is to treat all determinant areas as actionable. I can tell you, when I was a public health officer and we did our community health assessment, all of the data about economics, education, race, um, income, poverty, where did it go in my community health assessment? Demographics, yes, it was in the demographics section. And so it never really came up as something you would do something about. It was like, this is the background information that we can't do anything about. This is just how our community is. So I think our challenge is moving that data out of demographics. Demographics should be about this big. Here's how many people live here. <laughs> And most of the rest of that data should be in our social and economic factors. And then our CHIPS, another horrible acronym, <laughs> but our CHIPS must look beyond health behaviors and access to care to include the priorities from social and economic factors. So um, one of the things, I keep getting stuck here. One of the things um, that I have done in my spare time is an uh, assessment project, a research project that looks at the health of Wisconsin, or the quality of Wisconsin's, sorry about this. I was, 
I was not. I was using the computer screen, but here, this is the one I want. Um, I've had a research project that was funded through the Wisconsin Public Health Practice-Based Research Network that developed a tool to measure the quality of um, community health assessment and improvement planning processes. And then, um, as you heard, Wisconsin has this rich history of doing CHAS and CHIPS as part of our state um, mandate from our state statute. And so I looked at, um, we're just finalizing our, our data collection and, anal and beginning our analysis on this. So some preliminary findings from this study about these particular areas. So there's some really positive findings about what we're seeing in this state in regard to what we're looking at in our community health assessments. So 85% of the assessments included data from the four health factor areas that you see in the county health rankings. And 85% had some discussion within their report about the needs of special populations in the state. 78% um, had some level of disaggregated data in their report, although I will say the most common disaggregated data was by age or by gender, much less if you're looking at economics, education, or race and ethnicity. Um, and 85% had some type of primary data collection where they went out to their community and talked with people or surveyed their local residents or had those kind of qualitative um, primary data collection efforts that I mentioned earlier. There is room for improvement, however, and um, only 20% of the um, community health assessment improvement plans we reviewed had sought feedback from their community about the results of the assessment and the improvement plan. So we get information from our communities, but we don't vet the conclusion with our community members and check in. And we also looked at all of the priorities that were identified in those community health assessments, 458 priorities from 94 um, community health assessment improvement planning processes. And 14% of the priorities were focused in the social and economic factors. Actually, that was a little higher than I thought it might have been. I, I wouldn't have been surprised if it was even lower. So, the good news is 14% of those priorities were focused on the social and economic factors. The bad news is 14% when we estimate that social and economic factors probably contribute somewhere around 40% to health outcomes in our state. So opportunity for us to think, and I know, I've heard it from you, um, Julie, there's enough at our door. Do not put social and economic factors on the plates of local health departments. And I don't think it has to be on your plate as a primary, but as that matchmaker and the person who's helping lead the process and say what's important about health in our community, I think it's important to acknowledge we need, what are the efforts in our community to improve education, to expand early childhood education, to get more kids graduating from high school, to bring in well-paying jobs so that people have livable incomes, um, to focus on community safety and, and safe neighborhoods, and all of those kind of factors that are in that, that social and economic factors, and work with those groups that sometimes are not part of our central um, thoughts on community health assessment improvement planning processes, really our future, I think, of where we need to head. So, again, I want to, um, acknowledge Ann and the work that they did through the Hapi Healthy Capital Counties in Michigan, Barry, Eaton, Ingham, who else? Clinton, okay. Um, and this was part of uh, NACHO's uh, CHA CHIP demonstration project that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they took a model, modified many of the determinant of health models that we've been talking about and made their own version of it that looked at how opportunity measures interact with social, economic, and environmental factors, which interact with behavior, stress, and physical conditions, which interact ultimately with health outcomes. And then they took those four categories. I know you can't see this, but what they did was um, identify measures in each of those areas. So you can see they're color-coded there. So each of the four areas in their model, they um, identified measures that they wanted as part of their community health assessment to assure, you know, what gets measured gets done, to assure 
that they were having a full conversation about everything that contributed to health. And then as it moved into their priority strategic issues, you can see that the one in the middle, safety and social connection, and in case you can't read it from the back of the room, um, very much focuses on those social determinants of health. So uh, a really great example, you've got the website there, um, and you can also find out more about this at the Cha Chip Resource Center. All of the materials that the, the 12 pilot communities around the nation used and developed and, um, uh, and received as part of the technical assistance for this project are available to you too at this Cha Chip Resource Center as well as on the NATO website you'll find the documents created by those 12 communities. So really great examples, another place for central sharing. So again, that whole generous sharing as we move forward. So you've looked at it, you've thought about it, you've set priorities related to all of the factors that influence health. Now how do we find evidence about what we do? And one of the tools and resources that's available to you through the uh, Roadmaps to Health Action Center at www.countyhealthrankings.org is a tool called What Works for Health. How many of you have heard of What Works for Health? Okay. How many of you have been on the website and actually used it? Okay. And tomorrow when I ask that question, all of you will go to bed tonight and um, before you go to bed, pull out your iPad and look at what works for health. <laughs> That's your homework. Um, and then come tell me what you liked about it and what you didn't. So anyway, what this is is a one-stop shop for literature review around policies and programs across all of the different health factors in the county health rankings model. And we look at evidence from syst syst systematic reviews such as the community guide so if the community guide has reviewed it and found it to be um, an evidence-based policy and program, you're going to find it in what works. But we look at a wider variety of systematic reviews from education and from criminal justice and from other areas too, which are outside the domain of what you'll find in the community guide. The other thing that is different from this in the community guide, because I suspect more of you are familiar with the community guide, is that we show you a range of evidence. In order to get into the community guide, you would have to meet the criteria that we use for a scientifically supported program. But we'll show you programs that have some evidence, that are based primarily on expert opinion, that have insufficient evidence. It's a good idea, but people haven't really studied it much yet. Where there's mixed evidence, um, some studies show it works, but some show it doesn't. So use some caution and be evaluating carefully if you're working in that area and then evidence of ineffectiveness. And we only label something ineffective it's if it has the evidence as strong as scientifically supported. So it's a great one-stop shop for you to look for policies and programs across all of the health factors. So if your community says we want to focus on early childhood education, you can look there at, to where there are effective policies and programs, and then you can vet that with your educational colleagues in your community and, and have a starting point for conversation in areas that I know are not necessarily our bread and butter and where we feel we have expertise. As you think about choosing effective policies and programs, um, I think we're all familiar with this great picture um, from CDC um, that Dr. Frieden uh, has, has assisted with creating and really think, and this has been helpful I've heard in many communities too, about people understanding that if everything they're doing is programmatic, looking at counseling and education or clinical inter interventions, they're not going to have as much impact on health as if they get into those lower foundations of the pyramid looking at social and economic factors and how we change the context or the environment to what? Make the healthy choice the easy choice. Um, we have our national prevention strategy, and again, a document from our federal government, first time at the federal level that agencies across sectors have come together and talked about health, and has some really helpful, this is a page, page 23, with data that's at a national level, and when you can't get data at a local level, 
Sometimes if you can show a national trend, it can help drive the point home um, and th help you think about um, how you might target efforts in your community because probably my community in central Kansas isn't that much different than the whole nation as a whole. So this particular uh, chart shows that while smoking rates have gone down um, in general, we still see much higher smoking rates in people who have lower levels of education, high school diploma or less in our community than people who have a college education. And this can help target and drive your interventions in your community. So let's wind up with some talk about taking action. And one of the things that I find most helpful when it gets down to taking action and thinking about what we're going to do, after you've looked at what works and other um, systematic reviews and thought about where's the best evidence about what you can do, and, you, and then you talk with people in your community about where's their, where's their passion, where's their commitment, where's their money, where's their people who actually want to do something, is help people think about we can do things at many different levels in our community. And, when I was a health officer, people got sick. They, they're like, Chili's going to go um, draw the bullseye thing again. <laughs> I never called it the social ecological model. Well, that may not be true, but I tried not to call it the social ecological model. But I really tried to show them. And this is another great way to get from that personal responsibility to environment as well. To say, yes, we need to focus on what individuals do. But individuals live in families. And families influence what individuals do. And families and individuals go to school and go to work. And we need to think about what happens in those environments. And then we need to think about our community as a whole and how policy affects that. Really effective way. And so here's an example. If we look at the topic of obesity, where you could think about a menu of strategies in your community, all of which the health department is not necessarily going to be doing. This is actually. Um, based on actual model we used in Marathon County about six years ago, seven years ago, before obesity was quite as well researched and, and um, as hot an item as it is. But, you know, we weren't doing the weight reduction programs. Weight Watchers was, our hospital was, some less reputable people were. <laughs> but that wasn't really where the health department was going to focus their energy. We weren't doing family nutrition classes. Our Active Family Challenge was a program that our Parks Department did. Um, and so a lot of this was we were bringing different people to the table. We were talking about competitive pricing in, in, with employers in our community and how to help them think about how to reprice things in their cafeteria to drive people to healthier options. Um, we were very involved in creating a master plan for bike and walking trails and for working with our educational system to get funding for safe routes to school. <coughs> and so, uh, again, I think we can see how we put a whole community plan together, look at are we hitting all those levels of, on the rings and moving forward. But here's one then to take that same model and then think about education. And what are some of the strategies you can do at each level of the social ecological model to help move education forward in your community? So I think it's really helpful to, when you start from, okay, we're going to improve education, to, you know, let's target high school graduation or let's target early childhood and then let's think about what we can do at each level. Um, some of you may have, may have been at APHA a couple years ago and heard Linda Ray Murray um, talk about this, but I loved her idea about reversing the social ecological model. So the one you see on the right, you notice policy is the bullseye in the middle instead of the individual. And so it's the policy that the rings come out and influence individual behavior rather than putting the individual in the middle. And um, her theory was this would uh, move us past that. It's all about the individual and really keep us more focused on the policies that create those environments. So um, really like that. So I started with voices from prize communities and I'm going to end with voices from prize communities. So you heard a little snippet from each of those six communities. And what I want to do right now is show you um, uh, It's going to be the one we just watched. <laughs> Show you the story from New Orleans. 
And New Orleans is one of the communities that was led by their local health department. You'll hear from Dr. Karen DeSalvo, their health commissioner. And um, I want you to, to listen to this and, and listen how, of course, it's a story of rebirth. Um, and I think what I found when I've been to New Orleans and met with these people is they are so inspiring. It helps me think about rebirth in places that weren't um, annihilated by Hurricane Katrina. And we talk, she talks about the educational system and there's a big focus on healthy foods in the schools. But I want you to know, I spent a day with Karen DeSalvo and she was on her Blackberry all the time. I mean, she would go from, there was a, a, a school bus crash and what was the emergency response and how was, you know, did the health department have anything they needed to do? To another point in the day, she was paging through her Blackberry saying, um, our, our new academic um, results from our educational, our, our school district are coming out today. I can't wait to see what, how we're doing. We're working on this together. And so it was so incredible to see a health officer talking about everything from STDs to the educational outcomes of their kids to the safety of their community and really represented the way that community was starting to integrate all of these different factors together. So let's take a work at the great work they're doing in NOLA. Winning the Roadmaps to Health Prize is a validation of the work that we have done as a community for the last many years since Hurricane Katrina and has given us a new energy to continue this work that we're doing so that by 2018 we are the healthy city that we want to be. Hurricane Katrina exposed the problems we had in this community and the storm was an opportunity because it created a vacuum in all of our sectors and gave us a chance then to rush into that vacuum and create a new and better way that would improve the health of the population. A centerpiece of our work is an ambitious plan to assure that everyone has access to nutritious food and can be physically fit. FitNOLA is um, our collective goal as a community to be one of the most fit cities in the U.S. by 2018, which is New Orleans' 300th anniversary. The Fresh Food Retailer Initiative is a perfect example of a public-private partnership meant to improve health. It is a project that has been bringing uh, grocery stores to communities that are typically uh, food deserts. The Circle Food Store is in a neighborhood that's the uh, 7th Ward Treme. It flooded in Hurricane Katrina and it's taken seven years to pull together the right financing to reopen it. Without the Circle Food Store, this whole area, especially up this, in the 7th Ward, would be a food desert. It is a food desert, and people have, have to travel miles around to go to get their healthy, fresh uh, fruits and vegetables. This notion of a public-private partnership is one that we have brought to life in New Orleans. One of the things that Katrina taught us is that none of us can do it alone. We have to work together and these public-private partnerships are allowing us to learn from each other, are allowing us to, to help our city and help our state get more resources. And at the end of the day, it's a win for all of us. We're also working with our business partners to rebuild an underserved community so that everyone can have access to help. New Orleans East was flooded pretty heavily from Hurricane Katrina. And right in that space is a, a regional park that is been refurbished through a public-private partnership to create sporting venues in that community and let families exercise and play in that park. Around the corner is the new library, which is a spectacular facility, brand new, and it's always full of kids doing their homework and reading. There's a brand new police station, and then just down the road is the new hospital that's being built. Those are all the sort of mini parts that are critical for, for a community. A key partner for us is the school system, and we're working together to make sure that kids learn healthy habits that last a lifetime. Well, the Edible Schoolyard exists to change the way children eat, learn, and live. It's in the garden that the kids really learn where food comes from, and that's a really important lesson because most urban kids don't know where food comes from besides the grocery store. We're blessed with a wonderful teaching kitchen that we're able to use for all of our kindergarten through eighth grade students at Samuel J. Green Charter School. Can we please say good morning to Chef Callie? Good morning, Chef Callie. Our students harvest the food from the edible garden. They bring it into the kitchen. They wash it. They chop it. They cook it, basically from seed to table. Bon appetit. You may eat. I am personally extremely optimistic about the future of New Orleans and its health. 
New Orleans is an incredibly civically engaged community and there is uh, an overwhelming desire and interest from the community in attending to the public's health because they feel that they own it in a really important way, because they do. I think there are people here from New Orleans. Are New Orleans colleagues here? Great work. <laughs> A couple things hit me every, something different hits me every time I see that. And um, one of them is how quickly Karen DeSalvo can say public-private partnership. <laughs> Because it's kind of a tongue twister. Public, I can't do it as fast as she can. And the other thing is the optimism of a leader. I mean, how could you fail with that optimistic spirit there? And, um, you know, it's something I always try to remember because I try to be optimistic. I don't always succeed. So, in closing, um, here's what I think we need to do. Investigate the differences. Look where there are differences in your community. Focus on the drivers that most influence health. Dig into the root causes. Determine most effective strategies. And do it. So thank you. And um, I hope you've left today with some thought about one thing you can take away to think about how to further enhance your already incredible efforts you're making in your community to create health for all. So I think we have a little bit of time for questions. And um, I think there's one up here. I'm coming. Oh. <laughs> and tell us who you are. Too, that would be really helpful. I'm Liz Whitaker from Kittitas County in Washington State. Um, I was struck, you, you talked about the county health rankings. I believe we came out first in Washington State this year. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I wish I could take some credit for that. Uh, we, you can, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, but I believe that was based on the morbidity and mortality uh, the health outcomes are, yes. The health, uh, and uh, when I looked at all the other health factors, we weren't first in anything else. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wondered how that happened. And I had to, I had to wonder um, whether it might have been influenced by the fact that we are a college town and we have a large population of young, healthy mm -hmm. college students during much of the year. Is that part of it or not? It, it shouldn't be unduly... Um, influenced by that because we age adjust all of the data that we put in the health outcomes rankings. So just to clarify, because this is a great question, and I know others of you may look. So the count, you know, obviously I didn't talk a lot about the county health rankings. I will, <laughs> but we do two rankings: one is health outcomes, and one is health factors. And um, I don't know if the internet works here well enough. We can look at Kittitas County while I'm talking, um, but. So, do you know what your ranking for your health factors was? No. Okay. I mean, I looked at them, but I know that they were right. not as high. We'll see if it, it comes up here. But sometimes you will see this. You'll see a county that ranks very, very well in health outcomes, but ranks much, much lower in health factors. And there can be a number of different explanations for that. One is, we don't know why. <laughs> Another could be, we, your health factors are going to determine health down the road. So what we really need is not just your health outcomes ranking today and your health factors ranking today, because your health factors is really going to be determining more what your health outcomes is 10 or 15 years from now. So we really would need to look back and say, well, how is Kittitas County doing in terms of health factors 10 or 15 years ago? The other thing that can influence it is the size of your community, particularly with the health outcomes. How many people in Kittitas County? Um, maybe 45,000. Right. Total. So you're a fairly small county, relatively speaking. So sometimes um, 
you'll see some variation, particularly in the health outcomes, because we're looking at only five pieces of data there. And if you had a, some particularly bad years that now have become particularly good years, particularly in terms of premature death, that can cause some variation in the health outcomes. You know, in a small rural county, a tragic car accident that kills three or four teenagers can really send your health outcomes ranking plunging very quickly. Um, whereas in a big urban county, that wouldn't have as much effect because you have a lot more events. So maybe next year we're gonna be very affected by the fact that we had two heroin overdose deaths in the last three months. It could be, and as you know, we don't track in the county health rankings um, recreational drug use or prescription drug use, so you don't see that in the health factors, in the numbers, but clearly the topic of, of substance abuse, including drug abuse, is something you'd want to look at that data. The county health rankings really are a starting point for your community, not certainly meant to be a comprehensive assessment. So I brought it up, you can see. You, you're right, Liz, you know, just like most public health people know before we issue the rankings, you were 14th out of 39 counties in the health factors. So middle of the pack there, not the worst, but middle of the pack, but much lower than your number one in the health outcomes. So you're right, your premature death, especially if those heroin overdoses were in young people, could affect in years to come. Other questions, people have less. Julie, thank you for your talk, because I think it was both provocative and, and hopeful, ultimately, for us. And maybe rather than having to say public-private partnership really fast, <laughs> we could talk about public health systems. And excuse my jargonitis here, right. but the community health assessment and the community health improvement plan leading to the strategic plan. I wonder if you can bring us back to our conversation this morning, which the role that governance and boards of health play in this and ultimately how accreditation can reinforce the concepts that you brought up. Right. Um, one thing I want to say in terms of the New Orleans story that I didn't specifically articulate, but their journey towards the prize was also very driven towards their journey towards accreditation and a real transformation of their health department from one that was primarily focused on providing primary care services to underserved populations to a health department that's very focused on population health. Um, likewise, Cambridge, Massachusetts, has very much used their journey of going through the Roadmaps to Health Prize as part of their accreditation preparation. So I know that's not specifically the question you asked, but some of the work that they've done around preparing the application, bringing people together for conversation, has really contributed to the strength of their preparation for accreditation. So I think um, I'm very familiar with the standards in the current 1.0 FAB standards related to community health assessment and improvement planning process. And it's not just in domain one and domain five. There are standards in domain three, domain four, domain 11, that all relate to what um, we defined a quality community health assessment and improvement planning process would be. And it goes to many of those steps in that take action cycle that I think contribute, if you're doing a robust, multi-sectoral, comprehensive community health assessment and improvement planning process as part of your accreditation effort, you're really nailing this on multiple levels because you're going to be really successful with your FAB visitors and you're going to be really successful in terms of moving health forward. Um, I think that it is really helpful to be able, uh, and I've heard this in a couple of other presentations today, that one of the things the FAB standards have done for us, whether you're on the path to accreditation and you're about to hit submit, or whether you're in a pre-contemplative stage, is that it has added clarity to communicating with your policymakers about what it is you're about. What is it that public health contributes to your community? And I think that's a huge strength of those standards. I mean, I, I have my, um, my mother is my, my jargonitis check, and it took until anthrax for my mother to understand what I did. 
she said, I, I'm not happy about the anthrax thing, but I'm really glad I can explain to people what you do now. <laughs> the other day I got this email. Um, is our ACO some new thing in healthcare? <laughs> and I was trying to explain what an accountable care organization was to my mother in non-jargon, which <laughs> was a challenge. Um, but I really think it has helped explain to our mothers and to our policymakers all of the different um, pieces of the puzzle that we're accountable for. It has also helped explain to our partners what we're accountable for. And I also think it also presents some real challenges because you lay out all of those standards and think it's only the local, state, or tribal health department that's responsible for all of those standards. And that's a very dangerous message, first of all, from a resource point of view, because you can't do it. And secondly, from what it takes to move this forward. I mean, public-private partnership is a big part of what we need to move forward, and responsibility and accountability from folks throughout our community. So I think the other thing in response to the question, Les, is the opportunity to work with other organizations that are also under mandate to conduct some kind of community health assessment. I spoke briefly about our work here in Wisconsin with the Wisconsin Hospital Association. Um, our not-for-profit hospitals need your expertise, first of all, they don't know how to do community health assessments, and need, um, and you need their, their expertise and resources too. They're far ahead of us in terms of quality improvement. And they do hold meetings, and always with tablecloths on the table, and, and somebody else brings the food, and you don't have to come early and make the coffee. <laughs> and so just the, some of the cultural amenities about working with some other partners who have resources for doing some of the simple things that, you know what? If I didn't have to get up and bring the coffee to every community health assessment meeting, there's another half hour I can be doing other stuff <laughs> related to community health improvement. So, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be minimalistic, but I do think there are, are trade-offs that we can make. Your United Ways, I know United Way varies across the nation, but many United Ways are very focused on some kind of needs assessment and very focused from their national organizational level on focusing on health, education, and income. And so new and great partners to move the social and economic determinants of health forward. Community action programs, federally qualified health centers, and even chambers of commerce are starting to get into the act of saying, how do we look at the needs of our community? Sometimes through a health lens, sometimes through other lenses. So it's also, how do we work with our county planners? And when the comprehensive plan comes out, that the health section is truly focusing across health and help our county planners see that you know the transportation plan is also about health. <laughs> and I remember I tried to get my county administrator to get me a seat on the highway committee and he was like, what for? <laughs> I said, well, first of all, injuries and second of all, building them and so that they're walkable and bikeable. <laughs> and he's like, oh, not yet, Julie. <laughs> but they are now. I mean, there's that conversation is going on. So I think lots of opportunity for synergy as we think about accreditation and this work moving forward. Please join me in thanking uh, Julie for her presentation. <laughs>